So what you can imagine is that from where you are approximately to where I am, there was a wooden bridge that crossed the first half of the moat. From where I am to there, there is a drawbridge. Now traditionally drawbridges are designed so that you've got a hinge at one end, a couple of large bits of string at the other end and you duly wind it up and then Errol Flynn comes along and goes thwack and, and the drawbridge falls. Well in fact with real drawbridges you have rather more of a problem because in fact many drawbridges and almost certainly this one are actually designed so they're pivoted in the middle. So this end is made heavier than that end, so when you want to close the drawbridge all you do is you pull out a bolt at that end and the heavy end goes down, the light end goes up and it goes into that groove that you can see round there. So the, the pivot point is where the sandstone finishes and below that there's a 15 foot deep pit on either side, half of it being the uh, moat and half of it just being a pit. So that's the first line where they'd actually try and stop you coming in. Now because the moat was wet, there is quite a lot of possibility that there are waterlogged deposits underneath the ground here. And, and I still like to dig a hole. Uh, particularly I'd like to dig a hole over there because I think there's a very good chance there might be waterlogged deposits from say the English Civil War which would give us um, organic material like cloth, cloth and leather and that kind of thing. So it'd be really interesting to dig a hole. Uh, they won't let us, but hope springs eternal. So, uh, may I invite you to cross the first half of the drawbridge? On either side, we've got two towers. And the towers have got typical castle uh, windows. That is to say, they're very narrow on the outside and wider on the inside. So you've got a series of archers in there, or people armed with crossbows, who will be in a position to shoot out at you. And as these towers are at least two floors, there is probably a second window in between these two on the floor above. So they're shooting at you the whole time. And being built when this one was built, they also probably have a stone balcony between the two towers with holes cut in the floor. These are called machicolations and the intention is that they can drop things down on your head as you approach the castle. So they're certainly not going to make it easy for you. Shall we go for the ring? Now, as a matter of fact, this part of the castle is a slightly later addition. So the gateway here was probably finished by about 1325 and the gateway was added on just a little bit after that. Well it could have been actually quite a long time after that. Um, so this is about 1325, this could be even as late as 1400, although it's probably a little earlier than that, 1350 would probably be a good date. So we've got an earlier gateway here which has also got its own defences. You can see this great stone plinth here, which is matched by another one over there, evidence perhaps that there was another set of these machicolations over the top for dropping things down on you. Well, then you get to the first gateway. You are going to need to stand a bit closer because whatever it is I've got, I don't think it's catching. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you look up, you can see that there is a slot, and this is the the classical um, port colours. Port from French meaning gate, coulé meaning the verb to slide. Um, I actually took a party of French people around the castle and blow me, the French don't call it a port cullis. They call it an airs, which means a harrow. So we use a French word and the French don't actually use that word. Oh, the wonders of the European community. <laughs> So anyway, here we've got portcullis. The standard way of getting through that would be to pile brushwood against it and try and burn it down. But of course, they can pour water down the slot. So actually, it's very difficult for you. You would be working over a 13 foot deep pit, but underneath your feet. So it, it's not straightforward getting into this castle. Um, now, 
the next line of fences would actually be here and it would have been a fairly standard gateway in this position here. Mm. We're in the gateway itself, uh, which is a fascinating area of the castle. Uh, do any of you watch the programme called Time Team? Yeah. Yes. Well, periodically in Time Team, uh, in fact quite regularly, they will use the word feature. And feature is a word an archaeologist uses when they haven't got the slightest idea what they're talking about. Now, unfortunately, we have got really quite a lot of features here. So you can see we seem to have some foundations coming through, which are matched by foundations here, which are not on quite the same alignment as the building itself. Also, we've got a door or a window there. And again, sometimes using uh, sort of um, uh, time to speak, the wall here butts up against the wall there. So they were probably built at different times. So we seem to be looking at a number of different stages in the building of the castle here. And uh, I would be the first to admit that we really haven't sorted those out yet. But the possibility exists that these foundations here date to the second castle, which was the first one to have been built in stone. Don't worry too much about the history, I'll fill that in just a little bit later. Um, so there, the second castle. Then the second castle was knocked down, and the third castle was built, but the third castle was built in increments because they started building it, then they had to stop building it because they'd started illegally, and then they got permission to continue, but they only continued intermittently until the last big push to finish the castle. <coughs> so the side here might well be one of the phases of the rebuilding of castle, that would be the building of castle number three. But they possibly changed their minds. They were intending to do something and then did something else, which involved putting in the end walls, which are still part of Castle Number Three. So uh, we do have seem to have some changes of mind, some changes of plan. Unfortunately, that this the fact that there's a door or window there suggests that there could possibly be something over there. <coughs> well, we haven't actually found anything over there. Um, the whole area was, uh, became a, a 17th century stable, and there isn't evidence for any further building beyond there. So quite why there is a door or window there is forever a mystery, but there you go. Maybe we'll get to dig up with some, this side of it sometime, because this bit's never been done. Well, here, uh, we've got another portcullis and because last time we had a portcullis we had a gate on the far side of it um, we've got another gate here and over there you can actually see where the hinges were you can't see them quite so easily here so this is always known as the triple gate because there are three arches but actually it's it's the uh, quadrilateral whatever five is because there was the um, drawbridge gate, two gates there and two gates here, so that actually makes five. So, it is possible that having finally barged your way through this gate, you have actually got into the castle. So, welcome to Dudley Castle. Now, you might think that you'd actually got here, but the thing is that this castle was built um, or the final stage of this castle was built at about the same time when Edward I was invading Wales. And when he did that, he invented a whole new style of castle. And that style of castle is reflected here. Um, so one of the things that he uh, used there were what are called keep gatehouses. That is to say, if you work on the principle that the gatehouse is the weakest part of the castle, the strongest point it, the strong point itself is the keep. So he combined the two to make the gatehouse the strongest part of the castle. Now, they never did that here, but there are some features of both the keep and the gatehouse which suggest the influence of these. So, for instance, 
Once you've got in here, you still haven't made contact with anybody in the gatehouse. Sure, you can run a mock in the courtyard here, you can burn their house down, you can pillage their private chambers, but you haven't actually caught them. They are still here, they are defending this tower against you, and from here they can probably walk along the top of the wall and get up to the Great Tower. So the Great Tower and the Gateway can be defended as a separate fortification inside the main fortification. And if you want to get into that gateway, you have to work out how to get up to that doorway there. Now there is no evidence here that there was ever anything connected there. So there wasn't a stone set of um, uh, stairs, there was probably a wooden set of stairs. So if you work on the principle that people in there don't like you a lot, you're trying to climb up a wooden set of stairs. There's every possibility they've knocked them down as they climbed up anyway. Uh, they could burn them down, um, but they are going to make it extremely difficult for you to get up there. So the fact is, if you want to say you've captured this castle, we have to capture the Great Tower. If you'd like to come this way. I remember some time ago bringing an American party around here and I, I was able to tell them that because that was actually built after the English Civil War when parts of the castle had been knocked down and they'd knocked down the wall and the Ward family who owned the site by then um, put that up really to fill up the gap and it's a stables building and it was built in the late 17th century uh, and as I was able to tell our, our beloved American brethren that made this building the newest on this site, a hundred years older than their country as a nation state. <laughs> um, so we would have to go around there in order to get up to the castle. So uh, we either need to call upon Mr. Scott to beam us up or we need to take the more prosaic uh, approach of actually walking up the stairs. Now, uh, what I'd like to draw your attention is that when this castle was first built, the mound we're standing on was probably higher. And so there would have been a set of steps, probably here, but they wouldn't have to be, that went up to the base of a tower that was on top of the mound. Now, that first castle was replaced by the second castle, which was just a rerun, but built in stone. And at this point, I make an offer that I will then utterly disappoint you with its delivery, because I'm going to show you one of the ghosts of Dudley Castle. If you come up here under normal circumstances in daylight hours, Amy will actually talk about all the rest of the ghosts of Dudley Castle, but this is one I can actually talk about and show you, but as I say, you're going to find it incredibly disappointing. <laughs> because if you look through there, just behind the tree, can you see the form of an arch in the wall blocked up? Well, that is actually the ghost of castle number two. Because through that doorway there would have come a set of steps that went up to the top of the new tower on top of the mound. However, castle number two was knocked down and when they built castle number three, they redesigned this entranceway again. So what you've got to imagine is, can you see where that sort of step on the far side is? Well, the bit of wall on top of there is um, 17th century, so that's not there, and there would have been a set of steps coming up to where that lip is there, and from that lip to a similar lip on this side would have been, I think, probably a wooden floor, just made out of planks, yeah. things like that. Now, under normal circumstances, you come up those stairs, get up to here and then you'd be on a level with the Great Tower. However, if you were not a welcome guest, you'd come up those stairs and discover they'd taken the floor away. It's another drawbridge, but it's actually <coughs> the correct use of a drawbridge, a bridge which you can withdraw, so you just take it away. And so they've got to deal with a 15 foot deep hole. When we first started excavating that hole, we found all sorts of interesting things at the top of it, including crisp packets dating right back to about 1935 <laughs> and the skull of a um, what are the pink things called flamingos, flamingos. yes <laughs> the skull of a flamingo which we do not think was related to castle dietary habits but you never know <laughs> now when you get up here you're dealing with this tower now this tower uh, is the one that was built in uh, well it was probably finished 
in about 1324 or 1324, something like that. Um, it's a large rectangular tower, but it doesn't have any corners. All the corners have been rounded off with uh, part, part towers. And again, this is a feature which is adopted from the Welsh castles of Edward I, where you get a lot of rectangular towers, but none of them have actually got corners. At the bottom here, we've probably got a feature which is similar to one that we think we might have on the main gate, and that's another excuse for wanting to dig it up. Um, the fact that it gets broader at the bottom, and that's called a battered plinth. Now, the tower here isn't quite aligned with its foundations, and that's always been a problem because it's difficult to interpret, uh, and there are several possible interpretations. <coughs> the first is that the original mound was higher than this. Now, they may have made the mound lower to put this tower on it, or making the mound lower may have been part of the process of knocking down castle number two. But whatever happened, this mound is lower than the original one. Now, I did say that they started building castle number three illegally. They didn't have a license to build it. So it could be that these foundations are actually part of castle number three, and then when they actually built castle number three, the form that they finished was slightly different to the form that they were going to start on. But there is another feature, and that's the fact that there is a crack that runs through this foundation, but only at foundation level. So they could have started building the castle, and then discovered that the ground was settling, and that they were in danger of having a cracked castle. So they might actually have stopped building until the settlement ceased, and then they carried on going up, and the crack did not persist in the rest of the castle. So again, one or two things about these construction of the castle that we're really not entirely certain about. Um, this back of the has two functions. Firstly, if you're going to try and chop a hole through the wall, it just means there's a lot of unnecessary stonework you have to get through before you get anywhere. And the other thing is that it's actually a primitive shrapnel device. Because if I drop a stone straight down from the top, it hits this, shatters, and then bounces out towards you. Say that, but after the Welsh Wars and particularly the Scottish Wars, um, the whole uh, process of castle building actually changes in this country because the country does become a lot more peaceful, not totally peaceful, but more peaceful, and the, the form of castles completely changes after that time because they are less concentrating on defences. But many of the important parts of this castle are certainly well defended. So if we look at the actual history of the castle, because we've got a lovely view of the castle and we've got a, a nice visual aid as well. Uh, basically speaking, the first castle was built by a gentleman called Anskulf of Pikini. And he was a Frenchman. Now we are used to talking about the Norman invasion of 1066. But in fact, William the Conqueror did not have enough soldiers to be able to conquer this country. So he put out a general invitation that anybody could come and if they were successful they would be rewarded with land. And so as I say, Anskulf of Pekini is not a Norman, he's a Frenchman. And very appropriate for 2018, uh, if you go to the castle of Pekini, which still exists, and you look out from it, um, you will see that you are looking over a little valley. And that valley has been trapped across by Englishmen on a number of occasions. Uh, not least that uh, Henry V passed that way on the Agincourt campaign, that the bridge at Pekini was where Edward IV signed his treaty with the French which ended the Hundred Years' War, but more specifically the bridge uh, 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 at Pekini runs over a little quiet river which is called the River Somme, and that's exactly where it is, up in northern France where quite a number of the engagements of World War I were actually fought. So it's, it's a pretty significant area. Anyway, he comes here. Uh, he is not given lands initially because the first uh, Saxons who were defeated were the West Saxons at Hastings. Well, there were two great Saxon kingdoms, effectively, still in operation, Mercia and Northumbria, and they had not been defeated there was a possibility that they could actually make peace with William. But they never did, 
And so when first Mercia and then Northumbria revolted, William the Conqueror crushed the revolt and then he had more land which he was able to give to the sort of second rank barons, the people who hadn't got anything in the first handout. And so uh, Anskulf of Pekinny gets the land here at Dudley. It was actually the barony of Sedgley in those days, but he decided uh, he decided that he was going to he was going to make his capital here, and so I'm afraid Sedgley became subsumed in the borough of Dudley. Um, so there you go. Now, um, Anscorf has a son called William. Um, after William, we do not know entirely what happened. Either William was involved in some sort of rebellion and had his lands confiscated, or the lands could have passed to another family by marriage. But you get a new family here, and they are the Pagan family. And so William's castle is just timber and earth. There are really two reasons for that. Firstly, that in fact castles are actually mostly built by Saxons. And Saxons are not particularly good stone builders. They have no experience. It's reckoned there were only 200 stone buildings in England at the time of the Norman invasion, and they were all churches. So there were no fortifications or private houses built out of stone when the Normans arrived. So the local population, which is going to be doing the labouring, has no idea how to build a stone castle. And really, although we are in an area which is pretty significant for its stone, they have no idea where the best building stone is because they don't use it. So building in stone is not a real option. So most Norman castles were this timber and earth Mott and Bailey construction. Pagnall, however, it appears, rebuilds the castle and now we're a generation or so later and so he's got a bit of capital and a bit of know-how and he rebuilds it in stone. The problem is we don't actually know that he did that but we have evidence in, firstly, we've got documentary evidence, and there is a, a famous person called Florence of Worcester, who is actually a bloke, he's a monk. And he writes a chronicle, and it says something along the lines of, And King Stephen came with his whole army to besiege Dudley Castle, which Ralph Paganel had fortified against him. He burned the surrounding area and stole all the cattle, before going on to Shrewsbury by sea. <laughs> where he burned the castle and killed all those who tried to escape. Um, we think that by sea is, is a, a sort of French vernacular term because you get, do get this river, uh, you do get this wine which is called Entre de Mer between two uh, seas, but it's actually between two rivers. So the chances are well, when he uses that term he actually means he went to Shrewsbury by river, he actually sailed part of the way. Um, now, what does that tell us? Well, on the face of it, uh, it tells us just what I said. But it does say which Ralph Paganel had fortified against him. And then it goes on to say he went to Shrewsbury Castle, which was still built of timber, and that's documented, and he burned it down. Why didn't he burn this one down? Because Ralph Paganel had fortified it against him. That is to say, he'd rebuilt it in stone. And so, King Stephen came here, he took one look at the stone castle in its impressive position on top of the hill, said, in whatever the Norman French for it is, blow this for a game of soldiers. So instead, he burned the surrounding area and stole all the cattle. Now this means that the people around here cannot pay their uh, rents to, pa uh, to Pagnall, so it knocks Pagnall out of the war. So if you can't take his castle, that's the next best thing, you, you've actually bankrupted him. For the time being. So um, King Stephen does indeed burn down Shrewsbury Castle but this castle survives. Ralph Paganel, uh, who does actually go on to become the, the archetypal Sheriff of Nottingham, um, he, his, his son Gervais Pagnell uh, is involved in a rebellion against Henry II and there are a lot of fairly stupid things you can do in your life, but undoubtedly rebelling against Henry II is one of the more stupid because he wasn't a particularly forgiving king. In fact, it was really quite lucky that Pagnall got away with it at all, but he was fined 500 marks and was forced to knock his castle down. 
500 marks, you'll be wondering how much is 500 marks? Well, that's not too much of a problem. A mark is 13 and fourpence. Or for those of you who are doing modern money, 66 pence. But you do have to remember, you could buy two farms for a mark. So that's how much 500 marks actually is. Um, a lot of dosh, yes. So, he knocks his castle down, and as I said earlier on, I think the possibility is that he was forced to reduce the height of this mound as part of that demolition process. And then, the castle passes to a new family, the Summaries. And the Summaries uh, decide to rebuild the castle in the 1250s, but they don't actually have a license. You need a license from the king to build a castle, and they didn't have one. So they start building it and they are told to stop. And again, that may be the reason why we've got some of the foundations and some of the features in there that don't match up to what we've got today. Well, eventually, the summaries are involved at the Battle of Evesham, supporting the king, and they get given their license to crenellate. So they can now proceed with building castle. Unfortunately, a whole load of summaries promptly proceed to die in very short order, and so it's about 1300. Bef uh, it's about um, 1300 before you get a summary, John de Summary, who actually long enough lived to make it worth building the castle. So we believe that most of the parts that we've looked at so far were built by John de Summary in about 1300 to 13 1324. In 1324 he dies, I don't think very many people were cut up about that, certainly not as many as had been when he was alive, because he was a bit of a bounder. So, um, he dies and his son has already been murdered in his father's lifetime, so there is no heir and the pa castle passes to his sister, who is married into the Sutton family, and so there is now a new family here, and <coughs> they rebuild the house part of the castle which we're going to have a look at in a minute and the uh, Suttons in fact carry on all the way through because the people who held the castle most recently were the wards and they again had the castle by when it passed through a female heir who was married into the ward family so they are still technically the same family although the name has changed so all the way through just one single family line, although the name changes periodically. Now, just before we finish with the Great Tower, uh, there's one final line of defences that we need to have a look at. Once again, we have a uh, portcullis here, which, is, which can be drawn up through the windows. And thus then, just behind it, we've got a gate here, and the gate can push into a, push a bolt into a bolt hole here. You obviously have to get rid of that bolt, and in fact the bolt goes all the way back, right into that hole. I normally put my hand in there, uh, but it, with all the technology people carry around these days, you've all probably got uh, digital phones that you can actually have a look down the hole, so you're quite welcome to do that.